Welcome to Trinity Classical Academy, and we are so thrilled tonight to have the Fellowship for Christian Athletes here with us this evening. We have been anticipating this night, and we are encouraged to have scholar athletes from all over our valley here with us this evening. For those of you that aren't quite familiar with Trinity, we have 554 students, kindergarten through 12th grade, we opened our doors 14 years ago with 28 little people in kindergarten, first and second grade. And we're just thrilled and privileged to be a part of what the Lord's doing at Trinity through helping raise up young men and women to pursue purpose, wisdom, virtue, and courage. And so tonight, to have Fellowship for Christian Athletes with us this evening as they, with their ministry, help the next generation learn how to pursue the Lord through, really, athletics and the gift that children can be given to possibly play the game, whatever game it is, and how they use that gift uh, to benefit the Lord's kingdom. So tonight, we are encouraged to bring those two um, missions together. And to begin our evening, we are going to start with a word of prayer and some worship, and we are just grateful that you're here tonight. Thank you. All right, everybody, if you can go ahead and stand. And if you can, uh, maybe, I know you're kind of, yeah, fill in the front. Just come on forward. There's lots of room up here. Don't be afraid. It's not going to be too loud, hopefully. If it is, it's the drummer's fault. It's always the drummer's it's fault. It's always the drummer's fault. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for, uh, for this opportunity to, to lift you up and to just set our minds and our hearts on uh, why we even do what we do here with FCA and Trinity and uh, just all that you're doing uh, in, in this valley for your kingdom, Lord. Uh, we ask that you would just go before us and that your name would be lifted high here tonight. In Jesus' name.
The ruins come to life In the beauty of your name Rising up from the ashes God forever you reign And my soul will find a refuge In the shadow of your wings I will love you forever And forever I'll sing Sing it again let the ruins come to life In the beauty of your name Rising up from the ashes God forever you reign And my soul will find refuge In the shadow of your wings I will love you forever And forever I'll sing Oh, 
Good evening, Trinity. Good evening. You guys doing all right? Yeah. Man, God is good. And all the time. July 3rd, 2013, a young lady by the name of Aaron Brown made a decision to walk with the Lord and committed her life to Christ on that day. Being from the inner city, and having a younger brother who was diagnosed with cancer and was on his deathbed, she struggled with whether or not or even how to tell him about Jesus Christ because she did not know how to do that. But through the help and the discipleship of one of the staff uh, with FCA, she was able to muster up the courage and the strength to encourage her younger brother while on his deathbed, dying of cancer, to accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he did that. And at his funeral, the community was changed. So not only was this young lady, Aaron's life changed individually, but her family's life was changed. And her community's life was changed through this one experience through FCA. What if, what if through the influence of the coaches here in Santa Clarita and you the student athletes will use your influence to impact this community for Jesus Christ? Jesus said that the, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. There are 177,000 residents here in the Santa Clarita Valley. Did you know that? And did you know that 85% of these people are unchurched? They do not have a clear understanding of who Jesus Christ is. That is amazing. There's a lot of work to do. There are nine high school campuses here in the Santa Clarita Valley. There are over 15,000 students in which thousands of them were student athletes like yourself or like we once were, <laughs> some of us. And there are park leagues, rec leagues, all of that stuff going on throughout Santa Clarita Valley. 
So we can see right here that the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. What if? What if? Hebrews 10, 14 says, but how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? And it is written, whoever it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I want to tell you there's some good news. And Coach Rob has some beautiful feet. <laughs> I've seen them. But they're beautiful feet. <laughs> Pastor Jonathan has beautiful feet. The staff here at Trinity High School and, or Classical Academy has beautiful feet. The local pastors and the local churches have beautiful feet because they're bringing the good news right. of Jesus Christ throughout Santa Clarita Valley. Let me tell you what's going on right here in your own community. Six of the nine high school campuses are being impacted through FCA. That's what's going on here in Santa Clarita. We would like to be on all nine, and we're going to get there with God's help. There, were 500, there are 500 students that are meeting at our huddles weekly. 500 students on public and private campuses meeting every week talking about Jesus Christ. Getting pizza, having a good time, and being good at their sport. And out of these 500 students that regularly attend these, these huddles is what we call them, 71% of these people, these young people gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. And they've made a commitment to serve him and to love him for the rest of their life. That's changing the score. That's changing the score. And it's not just only happening here in Santa Clarita Valley. It is happening throughout, all throughout Los Angeles County. This is happening throughout the nation. This is happening throughout our world. Thanks, Kevin, that's right. Wow, that's loud. That's right. In, in L.A. County, uh, we're changing the score from Long Beach to Palmdale, from Burbank to La Mirada, and in the heart of the city in East Los Angeles and South Central L.A. So we've, we've talked a lot about numbers, and, and, and I like numbers, actually, and I apologize for, uh, I can't read as good as Kevin. I got the, can y'all guys read that? <laughs> it's big. So in, in Santa Clarita Valley, we have one staff on six campuses. So in L.A. County, we have 14 staff. So you do the math, it's about the same. We're on over 80 campuses in Los Angeles County right now. That, that's always amazed me in our, in our uh, culture that we can walk onto a public high school and, and people can't believe that. And I don't think maybe they understand the impact. We, we can spread the news of Christ at a public high school. We're on over 80 of those in L.A. County. 4,500 attend campuses in L.A. County. That's amazing to me. Uh, some more numbers. 50 recent decisions. So just this month at Lucerna High School, 30 students accepted Christ at the FCA meeting at lunch. Amen? Last weekend, uh, Kevin did a chapel at a uh, community college in Riverside. Before the game now, this is about three or four hours before the game, 20 football players accepted Christ for the first time. Praise the Lord. So that's 50. And that's all through FCA. A few more numbers. 264 athletes to camp at UCLA throughout L.A. County. 200 made a decision for Christ on decision. I know there were several people here on that night. It was moving. It's crazy. The efficiency of FCA is amazing. We actually had over 709, uh, over 709, exactly 709 students at the camp, and 560 made a decision for Christ. Uh, internationally, Jonathan, if you'll show that internationally, we're not just doing it in L.A. County. We're doing it across the country. Internationally, 11,912 campuses nationwide. 
9,780 coaches involved, 31,000 decisions for Christ last year, 218,000 Bibles, 516 camps in 38 states, 86,000 athletes at camp. UCLA camp, by the way. All right, go ahead and give it up. That's okay. So uh, the UCLA camp is the largest camp. I want to throw a few more numbers out there. Uh, 400. 400. Now, that seems like the number of miles that Kevin and I drove with traffic this afternoon to get here, but it's not. 400 kids attended a huddle at La Mirada High School last month. 400 students attended a huddle at Garfield High School last month. Okay? How about 300? That could be the number of pizzas we served at FCA last week, but it's not. 300 kids attended at Palos Verdes Peninsula High School. 150 at Long Beach Poly. And, and we can go on and on, okay? And, and, and I like numbers, and people give me a hard time about, man, you're too much into numbers. But I look at these numbers, and they're not numbers. They're people. They're kids. They're souls. Like Romans said, who's going to tell them the truth? They're souls. They're kids who need to be told the truth. And that's what we're doing in FCA. We're changing the score. Uh, we're telling them the truth. How do we keep telling them the truth? The truth about the hope, the faith, and the love of Jesus Christ. Okay, how do we do that? We're on the front line. Pastor, uh, uh, Brother Les, Chris, Kevin, 11 others. We're on campuses. We're on the front lines. But we need support. Just like Moses I'm, in Exodus when they fought the Amalekites. Moses went up on top of the mountain and he raised his hands. And when, while his hands were raised, we are winning the battle. But when he got weary, he got weak, he dropped his hands, we started to lose. So Aaron and Hur went and they held his arms up. They supported him. Okay, they gave him the boost he needed. And so for us to keep telling the truth on campuses in L.A. County and Santa Clarita, we need help. And we've got great support. We do. We are so blessed by local churches like the Sanctuary, like Real Life, like Church on the Way, and as Kevin mentioned, all the youth pastors. In L.A. County, we're on, we, we have a relationship with 48 uh, local churches and their youth pastors. So that, that's huge. And I know Coach Rob, uh, we have a great ministry here in Santa Clarita, and, and, and that's a big part of it. Um, the, the, the last thing that, that I wanted to talk about was um, this past week, I don't know if any of you guys know, but a week ago today, FCA uh, enjoyed our 60th anniversary. So 60 years. So, so one man, uh, uh, Coach McClennan, had a vision to impact the world for Jesus Christ through the influence of coaches and athletes. And his idea was that, that students, or, or sorry, that, that athletes would start to promote Jesus Christ instead of soap or beer or cigarettes. That's what they, that, that was a big deal. You know, you had the cigarette cards, and uh, so, so that's what happened. So he went to see a guy named Branch Rickey. Anybody ever heard of Branch Rickey if you saw the movie 41? So Branch Rickey got the vision, and in 1954, Branch Rickey became the first donor to FCA. He wrote a $10,000 check to FCA and gave it to Coach Don McLennan, and that allowed, in 1956, the first time a group of young college athletes assembled together in the name of Christ at a camp in Estes, Colorado, and we've been changing the score ever since. Thank you. A lot of people don't realize where the concept of the huddle came from within FCA. At our first camp in Estes Park, it was determined that it was important not only for the athletes to compete and to go to the large group meetings, but to break down into small groups with a college athlete as a huddle leader. We call it the power of the circle. And during that time, that college athlete, that, that huddle leader, was able to lead discussions, to read the scripture for that group to pray and it gave those athletes the opportunity to share what they were struggling with and to talk about their faith. Uh, it was a powerful, powerful moment when we determined that that was part of every camp and ever since then that concept of the huddle has grown and has been a part of the framework of FCA strategy. When they went back to schools a lot of those athletes wanted 
to take that huddle concept back. So we started the huddles for the athletes that were competing on campus and it continued to grow. We had coaches step in as huddle leaders and, and that power of that circle continued to grow and the influence happened as those athletes continued to dig into the Word of God uh, to share their faith and be encouraged in those small groups. The huddle is a key component in each one of those ministry methods, camp, campus, community, and coaches. We're using this power of the circle to continue to bring athletes into small groups, bring coaches into small groups, and every ministry method that we have to establish and expand the gospel of Jesus Christ in FCA. The huddle that started at Estes Park, Colorado, is now a key strategy to reach coaches and athletes and all whom they influence around the entire globe. Influence. It was there in the beginning, it's there now, and it'll be there as God leads us into the future. So we have huddles all over the valley every single week, and we wanted to bring one of our student uh, huddle leaders up here. And so uh, my name is Joe Small. Uh, I am on the board of directors uh, of the Santa Clarita FCA, and I have with me uh, Erica Wolotarski from Canyon High School. Hi, everyone. It's good to be here. Thank you for asking me to share. And so, Erica, what is your draw to FCA? What, what drew you to FCA? Um, I think it started out freshman year with just wanting to, to be involved in, um, in high school and also coming from a, a private Christian college. I really wanted to make sure that I plug myself into um, uh, a community where there are other believers like encouraging me and um, so yeah that's that's what I think is what started it and um, after the after um, after the upperclassmen left and we kind of had to start like getting into those leadership roles that was kind of intimidating for me thinking like ooh like should I do that I don't know sure. and um, yeah but just seeing how God has, um, God has taken that and um, just really uh, brought the club a long way, I think. And I, I want to thank Redden, the other captain. Um, <laughs> Give them shout outs from the for, platform. Um, he, he walks in most of the time with like half the football team. <laughs> and he's just, he just has a great uh, outreaching personality. And um, Thank you for Brandon and Coach Rob who really uh, believe in us and believe that God can use us to direct the club. So. That's incredible. Incredible. And so what, what role has uh, FCA played in your life and in uh, Canyon High School? What, what role has it played in the life of the school? Um, I, think it's, I think it's cool how there's a lot of kids maybe who don't, have um who aren't connected in a church and maybe fca is the only kind of glimpse of the gospel and jesus that they get throughout the week and to see That's that good. encourage them um hopefully encourage them and hopefully um make make a difference so just to see them plugged in and you know coming in no that's incredible and so how can we uh pray for you how can we pray for you and, and all of our huddle leaders um Definitely pray for me and Redden, because for me, coming in, um, I mean, I've played sports, like, in high school and junior high. I've played volleyball and track, but as of now, I'm not, I'm not even playing a sport, <laughs> and, um, and I wouldn't even really consider myself, like, a, a leader, but to see how, um, how God is using me, and um, that's that makes a difference to me and i i just want i hope that i'm asking you guys to to just pray for me and redden that um that we would be uh good leaders and also um just to just that we would be making a difference in people's lives and that people would 
come and um and and see god through us basically so absolutely so here's what i want to do uh, a lot of times when when a, as a pastor uh y you'll have people and it's like yeah i'll pray for you i'll pray for you i would actually like us to pray for them right now can we do that Amen. And, and so if you actually, not just our canyon huddle, if you are involved in a huddle, it could be here at Trinity or at any of our schools, would you stand to your feet if you are part of a FCA huddle? Stand to your feet. We want to just pray over you. If you are around one of these students, could you just lay your hands on them, extend your hands towards them, and let's pray for these incredible, incredible student athletes. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity that you have presented us with uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Lord, we pray that you would powerfully advance in every single high school in the Santa Clarita Valley. Lord, we proclaim that you are breaking down walls, breaking down barriers, Lord, in that you are equipping every single one of these students, every single one of these athletes, Lord, that you are guiding them, strengthening them. Lord, be with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Forty-two years ago, I was a kid, growing up in the ghetto, without a father, oldest of six, trying to find my way in the world, a, a new athlete. And somehow God touched my high school football coach. He picked me out of a group of 40 kids and saw something in me and spent $150 and sent me to FCA camp. I thought it was a football camp. Uh, little did I know it changed my life. But I never would be this man today without, without that coach taking the time to, first of all, select me and send me to this camp. My life was totally transformed. My athletic career was totally transformed. I came back a better athlete. I came back a better person, a stronger person. I came back with some, a sense of identity. When I went to the camp, I was struggling with, um, I was struggling with God. I had this dichotomy going on within me. I loved God, I loved His Word. I was raised in the church. Uh, but I thought to be a Christian, you had to be a wimp. And where I grew up, you couldn't be a wimp, and so I was struggling. I had never seen a man's man be a Christian. When I get to this football camp in Ashland, Oregon, back in 1973, and meet this guy named Jeff Seaman, who happened to be the starting middle linebacker of the Minnesota Vikings. This guy was like 6'3 and a half and like 250, he was an animal. <laughs> and I saw him just wear people out on Sundays. And then here at this camp, I saw this meek, humble guy, a meek, humble giant. And when we would be in worship at night, he would fall to his knees and throw his arms up in unashamed of worship of God. I never seen that, never seen that thing by a man, by a man's man. I seen it by guys in the church, but I had never seen a man's man worship God with his whole heart unashamedly and profess Christ. It freed me. My whole life changed from that moment I saw him worship God. That's the significance of FCA camp. Getting kids into this type of arena, in this type of setting where they can see men, strong men, uh, strong women, worship God, uh, boldly profess Christ and, and stand on his word and, and endeavor with their whole heart to live for him. I vowed that I would spend the rest of my life trying to send people to FCA camp so they could experience what I've experienced. I have no regrets. I thank God on high for what I've experienced because of FCA, because of what I've been introduced to. Um, my life has totally been transformed. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Um, <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. You, you just. You just don't know how happy I am to be here, to, to just be alive, to just um, 
to be able to stand before you. Every time I think about my testimony and where God brought me from and how he did it, um, it, it just takes me back. And um, because I know where I should be and I know what I could have been. Um, if you know me, you know anything about me, uh, you spend any time with me, you find out very, very quickly that I'm, I'm a hundred percenter. I'm one of those kind of people that if I'm with you, you know it. And if I'm against you, you know it. <laughs> I just, the way God made me. And sometimes I think about where my life would have been and what I'd be up to had I been on the other side of the word. But some, some coach took time out and spent a few dollars and sent me to a camp that absolutely transformed my life. Um, I don't know if that coach knew it, but he was my dad. He had more influence than my dad. He spent more time with me than my dad ever did. And unbeknownst to many of you, we coaches spend more time with your children than you do. There was an article published by the Barna Institute about two years ago which stated that coaches have more influence in America than pastors or preachers. And most people don't understand why. The truth of the matter is they spend a lot more time with your children than the pastors or the preachers. If you're an ardent church goer and you take your children with you, you probably go to church probably on the average of two to three hours a week. That coach has your kids for up to 20 hours a week. Not only does he or she have the company and the presence of your kids for 20 or so hours a week, they're actually living life with your child in those 20 plus hours a week. They experience successes together. Yes, your child and that coach. They experience defeats together. They experience good times. They experience bad times. They have times of anger. They have times of joy. They have times of prosperity. They have times of poverty. They experience together a whole range of emotional ups and downs that you may not even be aware of. For, so for all intents and purposes, your coach, your child's coach, has great, very great impact. They have the strings to your child's heart. And if we as Christians could encourage Christian coaches and make Christian coaches to be with our children, then we would rest a lot easier. We would sleep a lot easier. I would, um, I would say that many have never thought about what I've just talked about, the time that your child spends with his or her coach and the amount of impact that that coach has on your child. My high school coach, I haven't seen him in 39 years. He died of a brain aneurysm backing out a driver's training car two years after I graduated from high school. I was away playing college football and he passed and I never got to tell him thank you appropriately. I tell him thank you every day when I serve other young people. As the video stated, I've dedicated my life to, to sending children, I don't care whose child it is, to FCA camp because I know what FCA camp did for me. I know how it transformed my life. I know how it transformed my thinking. People ask me why I did it, why I do it. Well, yeah, I'm on staff now, but before I was on staff, I did it on my own dime for six and a half years. I bought pizzas every week. I bought Bibles. I taught the Bible studies. No one knew it because I know what FCA did for me. And when you attend one of those meetings and you, you start to understand what you're giving to those children, let me, just, let me just take it this way. 
That guy spent $150 to send me to FCA camp. He changed my life. And it's been 39 or 40 years since I've seen him. In those 39 to 40 years, I've, I've called, I've convinced hundreds of people to give their life to Christ. I have. And because of that, thousands more people will, because those numbers will multiply, give their life to Jesus Christ. My coach is dead and gone, and he has no idea what he did. He will never know until we see each other in heaven. And I just want you to understand the impact that a coach can have on your child, but not only on your child, but your community and the next generation. Because my coach, Dave Hotel, is long gone. He died 40 years ago, but his impact is still going on because he saw me and he sent me to camp. He reached in his pocket and he scholarshiped me to camp and it changed my life, it changed my family's life. Today, my other five siblings all serve the Lord. They're all active in ministry. You see what I'm saying? He not only saved my life, he saved my siblings' life, he saved our neighborhood, our community, and he's helped many others. My appeal to you is you have an opportunity through FCA to do the same thing. You have an opportunity to change this community. You have an opportunity to change the world. You have an opportunity to absolutely take Santa Clarita for Christ. What will you do? It was all because a coach sent me to camp. God bless you. Something that's just stuck out in my mind as this camp's gone on for these last couple days is just to always be all in, just like the theme says, all in. At the end of the day, it's all said and done, so you might as well just give it your all. Don't go half, don't go 90%, just go 100 all the time. But they'll just come for like the sport part, like the sport aspect of it, and then it just ends up becoming about Christ with the chapels and like the message, and they just really take it to heart. And in the huddles, there's a really intimate setting, so I mean, you feel like comfortable to share certain things that you probably wouldn't share with just anybody. And I mean, like really deep things about like personal life and this camp changes people it's not just it's not something that you like run into every day i chose to come to sba camp this year because i came last year and i i really enjoyed it i loved how it incorporated both like the sport and god and i got to like do both of them together and i never really thought of like soccer as glorifying god and um that was just really cool for me to be able to do both and see that I can honor God through my sport. As a youth pastor in Santa Clarita, I've gotten the opportunity to share it at several FCA huddles around the valley. And coming here to FCA camp has taken it to the next level. I mean, it really does step it up. They have the opportunity to interact with students from all over Southern California, with famous athletes and coaches, college athletes and coaches who have taken an interest in and pull their time aside to really come alongside and mentor these students in their various sports and incorporate God into it as well. It's just awesome to get the opportunity to see it firsthand and really take it to the next level. For FCA camp, I think one of the things that like impacts me when I go home, like trying to challenge myself with not being afraid to like be different from other people. That's something that like this camp like, encourages me. Trinity was introduced to the FCA camp this summer for the first time through Coach Rob. Coach Rob, we had the privilege of meeting Coach Rob last spring, and if you haven't met Coach Rob, that you know when you meet him for the first time, 
it's like Coach Rob. I'll never forget Coach Rob. And the minute I met Coach Rob, I knew Coach Rob had to be here and a part of influencing the children that the Lord would bring to Trinity. And that being said, he started FCA on our campus. We started having huddle meetings. They started in a classroom, and it's grown now to our FCA uh, huddle meeting in the Celebration Center twice a month. And Coach Rob has 55 students meeting our student meeting with um, students here. And our high school isn't that big. We only have 144 high schoolers. So you're, you have, those are good numbers, Coach Rob. In regards to that, though, he introduced our students to going to camp. And we had 14 students this summer go to FCA camp for the first time. There were 32 from our valley scholar athletes go to the FCA camp at UCLA. And we were so excited that 14 Trinity students would go. Coach Rob asked us to come on decision night and see what decision night was all about. And it's fascinating to me because there were 800 athletes there, student athletes there. And like Gabby said in the video, some of them think they're there to play their favorite sport the whole week. And they have no idea what is going to hit them between the eyes on decision night. And sitting there and being a privilege to be a part of that evening, you know, off to the side, and all the athletes are in the main part of the Poly Pavilion. And as the evening's going on, different worship leaders, speakers talking, you can feel the spirit moving. And at a perfect time in the evening, one of the leaders calls the students to make a decision. And at that time, it was unbelievable to see more than half of the students get up and go down for an altar call. It came to my attention after the fact that I guess 148 or so students made first-time commitments to the Lord. And another 400 recommitted their life to the Lord. And so... These students are going thinking they're going to get to play their favorite sport for a whole week and eat as much as they want in the cafeteria and hang out with their friends and stay up at night and, and build these relationships. And yet they have no idea that the Lord has handpicked every single one of them for that time, for that purpose. And it is life-changing. And we know that hope anchors the soul. And for all of those 800 student athletes there, the Lord's grabbing onto their heart and giving them hope. And that is life changing. And I'm so grateful that FCA, through Coach Rob, is a part of now our culture at Trinity. And it's for the super athlete and the not so super athlete. You know, everyone thinks it's about the sports, especially in our culture. We have a culture that says it's about me and breeds that in every sport we see. I thought it was fascinating last week. I don't sit down and watch college football that often, but that young man who uh, was crossing the goal line, Utah, thank you. And I know, you can be my interpreter. And... He drops the ball before he reaches the goal line to start celebrating himself. And that's so not why the Lord designs the game or for people to play. And I love that about FCA and its ability to help give student athletes perspective and what they can ultimately do for Christ. And so the FCA camp was life changing for our students at Trinity, and I know others in the Valley, and we're just grateful to be a part of that and having FCA be a part of our community.
Hold on, hold on. I'm ready to go right now. Hold on a second. Here. Jameis Winston, who? Let's go. <laughs> I've thrown less picks than Jameis the past few weeks. Everyone, it is an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, my name is Chris Ricks, and uh, as Coach Rob said, I am just uh, blessed and privileged to spend a few moments with you here tonight. Uh, they said I got an hour. Is that, is that true? Who could hang for an hour? Who could listen for an hour? All right, I got one man here. I got a 45, and one man 45 to 50, 55 to 45 to 30. No, no, no. We're not going to be here an hour. I'll make you a deal. If you can lock in for 15 minutes, I'll be done in 15. Is that good? Does that sound like a deal? Okay. All right. I am here to support what God is doing here in the Santa Clarita Valley. I'm here to help change the score, and I'm here for one of my heroes, Coach Rob. This is, this is my brother. This is my friend. And you want to talk about the first time I met Coach Rob. Mrs. Caddow talked about the first time you met him. First time I met him, I was like, Apollo Creed is on staff with FCA. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Rocky fans, any Rocky fans in the house? <laughs> and Rocky IV specifically is one of my favorite movies. So when I saw him, I was like, he's not dead. <laughs> Apollo's alive. <laughs> Someone said, no, that's uh, Coach Les Robinson from Santa Clarita. Like, Man, thought it was Apollo. So he is one of my heroes, but not just because of the great football coach he is or the great man that he is, the husband he is, the father, the man of boldness and conviction. One of the reasons is because he has accepted, to, accepted the call as a missionary. A lot of you may not know, but being on staff with FCA, we are missionaries. We don't have a big... Uh, organization or business funding our ministry, we raise 100% of our ministry budget. It's a nonprofit charitable organization, and that's how our families are fed, because we meet with faithful individuals, churches, businesses, and people that want to be a part of what God is doing. And my, my flesh would say, are you in or, or, or are you out? Because this FCA train, as we see, it's going to keep on going. And, and kind of the coach in me uh, would say, you know, with or without you, it's going to keep going. Now, my heart would say and my spirit would say, I want you to be on the team with us. I mean, I want you to help us win. Because as you can see, we're winning. No matter what the world is saying, we're winning. And a lot of you may have an FCA story. Some of you may not. And I'm going to share just a little bit, just a glimpse of my story. Because like I said, 15 minutes. We're probably down to about 13 or 12 right now. And I want to respect your guys' time. It's going to keep on moving. And I would say FCA is not the thing. Well, what do you mean by that, Chris? FCA is not salvation. FCA is not Jesus Christ. But FCA, like this church, is a thing that points to the thing. Right? You got me? Like if you're coming into L.A., or as I was driving up from the San Gabriel Valley, when I saw a sign as I was coming up that hill and it said Santa Clarita, I didn't get out of my car and hug the sign and say, I'm at Santa Clarita. No, I would have been dumb to do that. But the sign was pointing to Santa Clarita. Right? It was saying, go this way. This is how many more miles you have. The sign was not Santa Clarita, but the sign was something that was pointing to it. You see, FCA is not the thing. And I'm sure pastors and, and people who are affiliated with churches would, would agree that their church is not the thing. Jesus is. But these are vehicles that point to the thing. And I'm so privileged to be a part of an organization that is a big sign that's pointing to the thing. That's pointing to Jesus. And if you've been at camp, if you've been a part of an FCA huddle, if you've seen any glimpse of this ministry, even if you hadn't before tonight... You've seen it here. You've seen some numbers, which represent souls and people. You've seen glimpses of camp. You've heard about campus ministry. You've seen a glimpse tonight, even if you hadn't before you came in. This thing is for real. Jesus is for real. FCA is for real. And I'm reminded about it all the time. I mean, even today, I was at one of our huddles at South Hills High School in West Covina. And as I'm walking to 
the classroom where we meet, where our huddle meets, there's a, little, there's a huddle of kids like in the quad. And the language I heard, I mean, just walking by, what I heard, not only in a couple of young men saying, but what I heard a young lady saying, she must have been a freshman, maybe a sophomore. The things that came out of her mouth, it broke my heart. It did. And then I, I kept looking, and she took an apple like out of her lunch, and she threw it against a building, and it shattered, and they all started laughing, and a couple of them said, like, that was effing awesome. And they, I mean, they were just like, I just wanted to say, like, really, guys? Is that the best you can do with the mouth God gave you? But I was on my way to a huddle. That was not the time for me to interject, to interrupt them, but my heart broke. I had to get to the classroom. We had one of our coaches, one of our supporters, Art Masmanian, speaking at our huddle today. Anybody know that name? Art Masmanian? He coached at USC for many years, played for Casey Stengel back in the day with the New York, New York Yankees. And if, you, if you've heard of Mount San Antonio College, which is in my area, San Gabriel Valley, the baseball field there is named after Coach Maz. It's called Masmanian Field because of how many years he coached there and how many players he sent onto the major leagues. And he spoke today about his testimony, about what God did in his life and what he's continuing to do in his life at like 80-something years old. And another reminder on how real Jesus is, is at the end of this huddle, I see young people responding to God's word. I see a couple there, you know, a guy and a girl, and, and I don't know their story, I don't know what they're going through, but I saw a look in their eye, a look of, of maybe conviction on, on how they were living and, and how they are as boyfriend and girlfriend, and they were kind of looking at each other like, we need to change some things. And they didn't even say it, but I could see it in their eye. I could see how they were responding. You know, God was speaking to their mind. God was speaking to their heart. They weren't in church, right? And SAE is not church. We are an extension of the church. We're like a, we want to be a bridge from the community into the church, and more importantly, to Jesus. But you could just see it in their eye, and I was like, I love that they're here. It was a big football player. It's a cheerleader. You could tell they're a boyfriend and girlfriend. And God was speaking to them, my friends. He was speaking to them. I mean, just on Sunday, there was an invitation at our church, an altar call. And I see this, like, hardcore, like, Mexican gangster walking up to the pulpit afterwards, just in tears. I mean, this big, like, like Coach Rob said in the video, a man's man. He had a bald head. He was tatted up. Like, you would not want to mess with this guy. And he's walking down just in tears. I mean, that can't just be something in here. That's got to be real. That's got to be God speaking to his heart. I may not be able to convince everyone. I may not be able to convince all young people, coaches, and people that are involved in our community that God is real, that Jesus is real. But no one will ever to be able to convince me that he's not because of what he's done in my life and what I've seen happen in other people's lives. You just won't be able to convince me of that. There's a lot of you probably in the next five minutes as I share a glimpse of, of my story that won't be able to relate to what I share. You'll say, you know what? He's had it not as hard as me or maybe Chris Ricks has had it harder than me. Maybe you won't be able to relate. But I'm going to share, even as embarrassing as a couple details might be, I'm going to share some truth about my life and where I come from because maybe one of you can relate. And maybe one of you can say, well, if Jesus did it for him, he can do it for me. And what I'll share is that when I was born, I wasn't planned. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, my parents weren't married. They were dating. And all of a sudden, we're pregnant. So Chris Ricks Jr. is born May 1st, 1981 in upstate New York. And just a few years into my life, I can remember at about three years old, abuse in my home. I can remember alcohol abuse from my father. I can remember physical abuse as he abused my mom, fights they would have. I can remember him abusing me, beating me with a belt, pushing me down, hitting me in the face. I can remember him abusing drugs. 
And I remember my dad changing. Like when he drank, he became a different person. When he did drugs, he really became a different person. And I remember thinking, that's not my dad. That's not daddy. So at a very young age, obviously you can see there were some seeds planted in me on some things that I didn't want to do. And I can stand before you at 33 years old saying that I've never done weed, never done crack, never even smoked a cigarette. I've never had hard liquor. I've never even had a beer. Now I don't say that to pat myself on the back. You obviously can see maybe why I didn't touch those things. Because I remember thinking, I never want my kids to go through what I've gone through. My kids will never see a beer in my hand. They'll never see me lay a hand on my wife. And outside of a, a discipline, you know, outside of a, a hit on the butt, when they're doing something they know they shouldn't be doing, I'm not going to beat my kids. I'm not going to abuse them. And that was at a very young age. Fast forward, I'm seven years old. We get news that my mother has cancer. We're living in New York. And they say, you know what? Your family needs to get your mother out to this hospital in California. It's called City of Hope. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Maybe you've had a family member there. It's out in Duarte, in the San Gabriel Valley. So we bring her out here. That's what brought us to California. And God bless the doctors and everyone there. But my mom was only there for about a month. And then she was dead. And for all my dad's up and ups and downs, I'll always be thankful to him. Because wherever he was in 1989, in his life, wherever he was, he helped lead my mom to the Lord on her deathbed. Kind of like a story you heard earlier from Pastor Kevin. And I'll be grateful to him for that. Because according to my playbook, and I've had a lot of playbooks in my life. High school's about this big, college about this big, NFL, <laughs> when I was with the Chargers, sitting next to Philip Rivers, sitting next to Drew Brees. That playbook was about this big. But about all those playbooks I've had, none more important than this one. God's game plan, God's playbook. And in this book, the word of God, it says that I will see my mom again because she accepted Christ. She accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. So I rejoice in that. I will see her and she'll be more beautiful than she ever was. She'll have a new body. Again, I may not be able to convince everyone of that, but no one will be able to convince me that that's not true. Because it's written in God's word, and I believe that. So seven years old, I'm being raised by my dad. Single parent, dysfunctional parent at that most of the time. Remember, not a lot of money. Remember having food stamps. I don't know what it's like now, but it, it looked like Monopoly money back in the 80s and 90s. It was like this fake paper. I think maybe now it's a card. But we didn't have a lot of money. Lived in apartments, always had landlords. Even when we moved out here to California, it's like paycheck to paycheck. And then I went on to high school and became good in sports. Went to Bishop Mont High School, a uh, Pac-5 school down in the San Gabriel Valley. Did pretty well there. After my junior year, January of 1999, I committed to Florida State University to play football. Coach Bowden offered me a scholarship. Mark Richt was the offensive coordinator, quarterback coach. If you know that name, he's the head coach of Georgia. He's also in that movie, Facing the Giants. I know some of you guys have seen that movie, right? All right. Don't knock it just because of the acting and some of the budget stuff. It's a great movie, all right? Don't sleep on Facing the Giants. My coach, Mark Richt, was in there. He came in to talk to the championship coach uh, before that championship game. So they offered me a scholarship, said, come play at Florida State. I always thought I'd go to USC, UCLA, but late 90s, if you remember, they weren't very good. I mean, Toledo was kind of on his way out. Paul Hackett was on his way out. Now, I didn't know that Pete Carroll was going to come in and resurrect the thing at USC. But God was calling me to go somewhere else. So I commit to Florida State. Two weeks later, February of 1999, I'm kicked out of school. I'm taking shortcuts. It's not drugs. It's not alcohol, right? But I'm cheating in school. Not on one test here, not on one homework assignment here, on multiple tests. I've got people doing my work for me. I've got elaborate scams, as I thought, with, te with teammates, with friends. I've got girls doing my work. And it caught up with me. And I'm kicked out of school. 
Here I am, committed to Florida State. The next season, we're predicted to be number one or number two in the state behind Concord de la Salle. We've got everybody coming back. We've got Jason Leach, Jason Jones, AD Winters. A lot of these names my man Scott's probably heard of with CSA Prep Star. I mean, some big guys. I'm going to be on the cover of, of Prep Star magazine. I mean, everything's looking great, and I'm kicked out. So I have to leave school. I go to a school out in Orange County called Santa Margarita Catholic High School. They just had a quarterback graduate. He's going on to USC. His name's Carson Palmer. He said, we need a quarterback. So I kind of get a breath of fresh air. I go out there. Don't have a great season. It's our first year in Division I, moving up from Division VI. Separate my shoulder in the fifth game of the season. Who do you think we were playing? Any guesses? Bishop Amont. Separate in the second quarter, any other game I would have come out. And even though it was my fault that I was out of the school, you know, as a young, prideful, arrogant, cocky kid, I'm saying I'm not coming out of this game. I finished the game. By the grace of God, we won. Beat the number two team in the state. But my numbers weren't that great the rest of the year. By the grace of God, Coach Bowden kept my scholarship to Florida State. I go on to Florida State, and I think this is my new fresh start. Everything's great. I'm away from California. I'm away from the articles and the blogs that were just starting there and talk about Chris Ricks and he's a punk, he's a jerk. It was all true. But I was away from dad too. And I thought I had my freedom. So freshman year, I'm redshirting because there's a Heisman Trophy candidate, senior Chris Winky, who just led Florida State to a national title in 99, my senior year of high school. So I redshirt. And I think, you know what? I'm going to have fun this year. So I'm not drinking. I'm not doing drugs. But I'm going out with the guys. Friday nights, Saturday nights, a lot of weeknights. I'm going out to the clubs. I'm picking up girls. I'm coming back to my dorm room. And I'm living in sin. If I could just be real with you guys. I didn't come up here to be fake. I didn't drive up here to be fake. And I don't think you came here tonight to hear something fake. I was living in sin. The sin I was living in in high school with my girlfriend was now magnified because I'm a big-time quarterback from California. And I thought I had my freedom, but I would find out that I was really living in bondage. I was a slave to my sin. And at the end of that redshirt freshman year, I'm told that you're going to be starting next year. You've got a chance to take over this team as a freshman, be the first freshman starting quarterback at Florida State. I've got everything ahead of me. And I remember waking up one morning in the early part of summer of 2001 as I'm finishing my freshman year of college, my redshirt year. And I remember waking up one morning with someone next to me who wasn't my wife, wasn't even my girlfriend, and I remember thinking, there's got to be more to life than this. There's got to be more to life than just playing football, sleeping around. There was something empty in here. And about that same time, Coach Bowden told us about FCA. He said something like, All right, now, now man, it, it, it's Tuesday night. I want you to go check out the FCA in the locker room. Like, the FCA? What is that? I didn't know what the FCA was. But some of my teammates who had been, they said, hey, yo, Chris, there's going to be milk and cookies there. <laughs> if any of you saw me walking, I got a plate over here with some cookies, some brownie bites. I didn't know if it was legal to bring in the sanctuary, but I was bringing them in here. Because I've got a sweet tooth. I only work out like, coach, I don't know your motive for working out, coach. Mine is only because of how I eat. I have to work out. Or else I'll, I'll look like a lineman. And even though I'm retired, I, I vow I'm not going to look like a lineman. I love them, but I don't want to look like them. <laughs> so I go check out the FCA. And I heard the gospel that night in just a different way than I had heard. Anyone know the name Deion Sanders? Prime time, high stepping. I would do it right now. I could do it, but I'm wearing dress shoes. I'm not going to high step on stage. But you, if you've seen it, you have the visual. Primetime Dion. And I had, heard the, I had heard the gospel before. I wouldn't say I grew up in church. I was a CEO Christian. Anybody know what that is? Not an owner of a church, but does anybody know? 
Christmas and Easter only. You got that? CEO Christian, Christmas, Easter only. One time I said Christian, Easter only. And people were like, what does that mean? I got it right this time. Christmas, Easter only. That was about the only time you'd see me in church. So I wouldn't say I was brought up in church, but I, I kind of knew some hymns. I knew some homilies and scriptures, and uh, I, I went to confession at times in high school on a, on a Monday, or I went to church on a Sunday, only to go back to the same thing I was doing Monday through Saturday, and then come back again on Sunday and wipe the slate clean. And I just heard the gospel differently. And I said, at the end of that huddle, I said, I want to be like that man, Deion Sanders. Not because he's a great athlete, but because of the husband that he is, because of the father that he is, how he changed his life. And more importantly, I said, I want to be a man of God. There was a seed plan in my heart that night. I want to be a man of God, not just a quarterback, not just a star athlete. And that started the process for me, my friends. And as I get ready to conclude, I don't know what your story is. I don't know where you're at in the process. But after that, I got plugged into a church. I gave my life to Christ. I was baptized because I had made the decision, not because someone had made it for me when I was a baby. I said, I want to be real. See, I was being a hypocrite for, for too long. So many times in high school and even early on in college, I would throw a touchdown, I would get down, and I would do this, and I would point to the sky. I mean, I was, I was T-bowing before T-bow was T-bowing but I wasn't real. I wasn't living it out. People knew, oh, Chris Ricks is a Christian. He points to the sky, and, you know, he wears a cross, and he sometimes has scripture written on his tape, on his wrist, but I knew I wasn't living it. And it talks in God's word about being hot or cold. And if you're lukewarm, he'll spit you out of his mouth. And there's no gray area there, my friends. That's pretty self-explanatory. And it came to a point where I said, I'm either going to do this or I'm not going to do it. Because I was struggling. I was like, there was like conviction when I was trying to walk out and then I'd fall back into sin. And I said, you know what? I, may, I might as well just live in sin. It'll be more fun for me. Because I was struggling after I started hearing the word and God started speaking to me. I knew who God was calling me to be. And FCA started that process for me. It was a thing that was pointing to the thing. And that's just a glimpse of kind of how God got a hold of me. He used this cool, fun, athletic ministry with the influence of an athlete to get through to Chris Ricks as a freshman in college. And that summer is where I committed my life to Christ, 2001, at a uh, conference, church conference in Tennessee. You know, and we heard Mrs. Caddow say that it's not just for superstar athletes, it's not just for athletes and I would even add to, add to that and say, FCA is not just for athletes. It's for non-athletes. It's for Christians. It's for non-Christians. This is not an exclusive club. We want everyone to be a part of it. Because as we know, a lot of our friends, teammates, and coaches may not go to a church. They, not, they may not be being fed. But this could be the starting point for them, like it was for me. To help hopefully get them plugged into a church or in, into the things of God. And that would be my, my call to arms tonight. And as we, as we finish and we go into this playbook, I'm going to read one of a, a scripture that God put on my heart that maybe it will speak to you. And it's Ephesians 4. And it talks about unity and diversity in the body of Christ. A lot of us are from a lot of different areas, a lot of different backgrounds. But God can use you in this ministry. I believe God wants to use you to be a part of our team because we're winning. We're going to win this thing. I mean, the story's already been written, and if you've gotten a revelation, you know that we win. I want to be on that winning team. I'm glad I'm on the winning team now. And even more than when I signed that letter with Florida State my senior year, I made a commitment about two years later that was even bigger than my letter of intent with FSU, but it was with God. It was with Jesus Christ. And then I really got on the winning team for eternity. And it talks in Ephesians 4. It says, I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. Many 
are called. Few are chosen, and I believe few choose to be on the winning team. It says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. Anybody have any grace in their life? Young people, I didn't know what a definition of grace was probably till I got to college. Here's a simple definition. Grace, getting what you don't deserve. Grace is getting what you do not deserve. You have probably have some grace in your life, like me. I've had a lot. God's given me a lot of grace. Goes on to say, For it says, When he ascended on high, he took prisoners into captivity. He gave gifts to people. Your gift may be evangelism, prophecy, Preaching the word, maybe volunteering your time, maybe your resources. I don't know what gift God has given you, but we need more if we're going to do more. We need more if we're going to do more for the kingdom. It says, but what does he ascended mean except that he descended on the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is the same as the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. I believe if it went on, it would probably say some businessmen, you know, some teachers, some coaches, some influential people in this community. And I'll end here as it says in verse 12. For the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we reach all unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son. I'll read verse 12 again. Ephesians 4, 12. For the training, God has done all this, brought us all together for the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. Pastor Kevin Actually, I believe it was, was Tommy, our county director, that referenced Moses' hands being lifted. That as long as his hands were up, the Israelites were having victory over the Amalekites. Who is Aaron in here? Who is her? Who's going to help lift up the hands of Coach Les Robinson? Of Mrs. Brenda Robinson? of Brandon, one of our new teammates? Who's going to help lift up the hands of of even some of our our board members and supporters that help make this ministry possible in this area? Because I do believe as as long as Coach's hands and the rest of our team's hands are lifted, we're going to have victory over this thing. Again, the world would say that, that we're winning through music, media, and movies, and everything we see. But as you see, we're not losing. We're winning. But we can't do it without you. Coach can't do it alone. He's strong. And he may not say it tonight, but I believe in his spirit. Just like Apollo Creed, he's saying, I want you. I want you. He can't do it alone. He's strong. And we have some strong teammates, but we cannot do it alone. We live in a one-mile world, my friends. Jesus called us to live a two-mile life called us to live a two-mile life, to do more, to do a little bit more than the person next to us might do in the world. What may, otherwise, what makes us different? What makes us different from everybody else that's doing the same old thing? Help me. Help us. Help Coach Rob, God bless you. Help Coach Rob, help Brenda, help Brandon, Help our board. Help our team. Do more. Go farther than even what we've seen tonight because there's a lot more work to do. But we are going to win. This train is going to go on. And I'm all for championships. Listen with me. Listen to me, guys, especially football players, you athletes. Listen to me. I love championships. 
I want you guys to win on Friday. I want you to keep on going because championships are awesome. This championship ring that I have from Florida State, I'm proud that I have. I put a lot of work into it. But even if you do win the championship, a week later, and anyone who's bought a car, a house, or something of value, you know what happens a week, a month, a year later. You're searching for something else. You want the next best thing. I believe that's how God made us because he would show us that only he and his son Jesus can fill that void. So as great as it would be to win one of these, some of you have one from last year. Do you wear it every day? Probably not. Do you think about it every day? Probably not. Championships are great. I'm all for it. I want you guys to win. But at the end of the day, all this is is a piece of metal. That's all that is. What's really cool is the memories of winning a championship, the relationships that you have in here, and your relationship with your creator. And my prayer is that your savior, Jesus Christ, that lives forever. Football, or enter your sport, is temporary. Your faith is forever. And my prayer, at the end of your life, heck, even at the end of your high school career, maybe some of us at the end of retirement or when retirement starts would be that you can look up and you can go to bed at night and in your heart of hearts you can say I have fought the good fight I have kept the faith I have finished the race my ask would be help us continue to win this race help us finish this race and help us fight this fight of faith that our young people are going through. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it, man. Uh, I just want to just take a moment before I have Liz come up and, and close down our evening. I just want to take a moment, first and foremost, to thank both of you uh, for what you're doing on this campus. Um, you have a gift in this couple, and uh, they're doing amazing things. And, uh, you know, we do not take uh, being here lightly. Um, this is a team effort uh, by all means, but um, there's something about leadership that cuts the way, and uh, you're doing an amazing thing not only at this school but in this valley. So I appreciate that. And on behalf of all the board members of FCA and just what God's doing throughout the different campuses, you're part of that. And uh, that's something to not only be recognized, it's not what I'm calling ear candy. I'm not just saying that to, to make you feel good, but uh, when something is legit, you got to call it out as such. So I just wanted to take a moment to say that. Uh, just before we, we get going here, I want to share just one thing with you, and that is the theme of tonight um, for some of view, um, as you saw some of the advertising that was uh, put out, is keeping Christ, keeping score. It was mentioned earlier, the uh, sole motivation for what we do in FCA is Christ. But that little second part is an important part. We're keeping score. A number of years ago, some of you remember, especially the young people, they wouldn't be, wouldn't be in this category per se, but Katrina hit in the South. And uh, when that whole thing played out, a number of uh, schools actually had their scoreboards knocked out. And it was kind of this interesting thing, and I read an article a couple years ago that basically they had done some research on these schools where they had lost their scoreboard, and they, they, they looked at the fact that the whole game was altered because they didn't have a scoreboard. Now think about that for a second. Especially with football players. You guys are doing awesome, by the way. I got to call that out right there. All right, Coach Rob and his team's doing an amazing thing. Keep it going here. But imagine football players, if you didn't have a scoreboard, what would happen? What down are we at? Are we at? You know, how much time is left in the game? You know, here, here's an amazing thing about the study. They showed that people who were sitting in the stands didn't know how to cheer because they didn't know what the score was. So it impacted the very fact that they could even, couldn't even cheer. I mean, how depressing would it be to see cheerleaders who can't cheer, right? Because they don't know what's going on, right? So here's the, here's the thing. Scoreboards matter because it not only tells you if you're winning or losing, but it gives you an indication of how you need to adjust to, to, 
to press in a little harder, even as Chris was saying. And so we're keeping score. You saw a lot of stats tonight. You're probably going to go to bed tonight thinking, oh my gosh, I got so many numbers going through my head. But here's the thing, and it was mentioned earlier, God cares about numbers. Little side note, he named an entire book in the Old Testament on that fact. So he, he's into numbers because it's people and it's lives, and you know that's, he's, he's into the number thing. But here's the most important thing about all of that, is that it represents uh, individual lives that will be impacted for eternity. And, and we have a phrase here in FCA in Santa Clarita, we want to change the score. But if we're going to change the score, uh, we're going to have to run the right plays. And we got to look at that scoreboard and go, okay, how's it going? We know in eternity we're going to win, but if we just kind of take our, our sweet little time and eternity is on the line, uh, things aren't going to happen. Both of my daughters play club soccer, and just so happens, you know, proud, proud dad moment here, this last weekend they had some of their teammates come to church. It's just one of those, you know, kind of rare things that happened. But I remember my daughter saying this. In fact, it was last night. She said, you know what? Eternity is a long time. And if I really love my friends, I can't just sit around and, and wait for them to just pass on to eternity without hearing this good news. We possess good news. So we're going to run some plays this year that we want to share with you. Check up on the, on the screen here. They're going to put it up here uh, real quick. Our 2014-15 goals. Uh, we want to have three new huddles. Golden Valley, Valencia, Legacy Christian Academy. I know they're a rival, but, you know, they, they need Christ too. But here, here's what's going on. Golden Valley, Valencia, Legacy. We want to see them come online this year. We want to see this thing grow. Not so that we can point to the sign, as Chris said, but point to the, 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 the source of our faith, and that is Jesus Christ. Also, 50-plus athletes to UCLA camp, 100-plus decisions for Christ. We want to hire two part-time field reps. We want Bibles to every SCV, FCA student athlete. We want financial sponsors for weekly huddles. These are just some of our goals, some of our plays we want to run. This is our playbook. As you head out tonight, I know you got to get home to homework. I said it. I know. It's terrible. Some of you guys have homework. Some of you are just dreaming of your pillow right now. But before you get to that pillow and you get to that homework, as you're heading down and you go down that, those stairs, we, we want to put this playbook in your hand. And we have some other, some other information that we love to put in your hands just so you can walk with it. And that information is what we call pray, play, stay. And basically it breaks down to this. We need your prayers. But not just to, to, to throw up little, you know, God bless them prayers, which are good, but a little more specific. So we've provided some information on, on what to pray for because that helps us with our spiritual covering. Number two, we want to play, and that helps us to, to move forward in our function. That means with our weekly huddles and how to get kids to camp. Last but not least, stay, is we want to we wanna be in this valley a little longer than a shooting star. You know, shooting stars are beautiful, but, oh, look, they're gone. That's not what we want for FCA in this valley. We want FCA to be uh, here a lot longer than, and, and Coach Rob, he's pretty ripped, but he's not young, and he's not always going to be around. I'm not always going to be around. So, we, you know, we're, we're planting seeds for a tree which shade we're not going to sit under. And that's the reality. We want some sustainability. And any good thing means we, we think about it for the long haul. And so we have some information. You want to pick up one of these Pray, play, stay cards as you head out before you hit that pillow, before you do your homework. We want to put this in your hand. And last but not least, we have uh, some information that, we, that we'd love for you to fill out if you get a chance. It's a little second. We want to stay connected with you. Literally, we want to just keep you updated on what, what the scoreboard is saying. And uh, there's a lot going on week to week, month to month. We want to keep you apprised. But also, if you want the, like, the real-time thing, you want to check out our social media. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Please, uh, friend us. Uh, we're part of a team, but we'd love for you to join in and, and, and what God is doing. And we believe there's something very significant playing out, and we're just on the ground floor. God wants to do something amazing, and everyone has a place. Everyone has a role on this team, and God's going to do some amazing things. Liz. Stay up here. Stay up here. So can we just say thank you? Thank you to Pastor Jonathan and... Chris Ricks, Coach Rob, and their team, thank you so much. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for um, making tonight possible. And we look forward to um, doing this again. And, I mean, even if everybody just told one other person, that would make this evening double in size and sharing the gospel. I love the, um, 
we're planting trees for shade we're not even to sit under. And that's what we're doing. Um, for, you know, who knows what the Lord's going to do with your lives, but he has a plan for it. And it's purposeful. He said in Jeremiah 29, 11. And for anyone who's here, because we're here, he has a plan for us still because we're breathing. And he's just stuff for us to do. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And Chris Ricks, do you mind coming up and closing us in prayer tonight? And thank you. Oh, and before we close out, their table is out there. Be sure to stop by and um, see that, have a chance to connect with their team and uh, see maybe what the Lord might uh, move in your heart to do. Thank you. Maybe can, can Colton throw some passes afterwards? Can we get some pat and goes going? Get some passes? All right. Hey, speaking of social media, if you guys, please stay connected with FCA social media. Stay connected with Coach Rob. I think it's at Apollo. I may not have time to, to talk with everyone after. I know some of you got to go, but, but seriously, I'd like to stay connected with you guys, especially some of you young people who I know are really active on social media. So if you want to stay connected with me, um, shoot me a message. I promise I'll shoot you one back. You just give me 24 hours. I try to have a 24-hour rule. At uh, Coach Ricks on Twitter, you saw it up there, also Instagram. I'd love to just hear what God's doing in your guys' life and stay connected with you guys. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for this evening. And... I don't know all the reasons why you had each, every, each and every person here, but we do believe that you had them here for a reason. And we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds our future. And, and we know who holds the future of this ministry in this area. It's not just Coach Rob. It's not the pastors. It's not even supporters. It is you, God. This is your ministry. And we are honored and privileged that you would just use us with our past and, and everything that we've done and gone through but because of what you've done in our life, that you would use us as a team, everyone in this room, to make an impact for your kingdom. And my last prayer would be that people would be open, that their minds would be open, that their hearts would be open to how you've called them to be a part of this team, that they would hear it, they would receive it, and that they would take action. Because intention without action, as we know, is, is nothing. That they would take action, that they would make a play a lot of plays to help us continue to win this game. So I thank you for every body, every heart, every soul, every destiny that is in these seats tonight. And I pray that you would use them in the way that you want to use them to be a part of this winning team. We thank you for tonight. I thank you for what you're doing in this area. You are moving in the Santa Clarita Valley. And you are changing the score. We love you and we thank you. And everybody said... <laughs>